Hello and welcome to Chapter 3, Medical, Legal, and Ethical Issues of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the ethical responsibilities and medical legal directives and guidelines pertinent to an EMT. The EMT approach to patient care relating to confidentiality, consent to treat, refusal of care, and advanced directives are going to be explained. Organ donor systems and policies, evidence preservation, and end-of-life issues are also discussed. All right, so let's get started. The basic principle of emergency care is to do no further harm. So a healthcare provider usually avoids legal exposure if he or she acts in good faith and according to an appropriate standard of care. So even when emergency medical care is properly rendered, though, sometimes you may be sued by a patient seeking monetary compensation. So let's talk about consent first. Consent is permission to render care. And if a person, a person must give you consent for treatment, if the patient is conscious and rational and capable of making informed decisions, he or she has the legal right to refuse care. The foundation of consent is decision-making capacity. So what this means is the patient can understand and process the information provided, and the patient can make an informed choice regarding medical care. So patient autonomy is the patient's right to make decisions about his or her own health. So in determining a patient's decision-making capacity, consider these factors. So is the patient intellectual capacity impaired by mental limitation or dementia? And is the patient of legal age, so usually it's 18 years in most states, is the patient impaired by alcohol, drugs, serious injury or illness? And does the patient appear to be experiencing significant pain? Does the patient have a significant injury that could distract him or her from a more serious injury? And are there any apparent hearing or visual vision problems? Is there a language barrier? Or does the patient appear to understand what you're saying? Does the patient ask rational decisions that demonstrate an understanding of the information you are trying to share? Next, we're gonna talk about express consent. And so with express consent, the patient acknowledges he or she wants you to provide care or transport. To be valid, the consent that the patient provides must be informed consent, which means that you explain the nature of the treatment being offered, along with the potential risks, benefits, and alternatives to treatment, as well as the potential consequences of refusing care. Next, we're gonna talk about implied consent. So implied consent applies to patients who are unconscious or otherwise incapable of making a rational informed decision about care. And so on this slide, you'll see figure 3-1, when a serious threat to life exists and the patient is unconscious or otherwise unable to give consent, the law assumes that the patient would give consent to care and transport to the hospital. This is implied consent. Okay, implied consent like I said, only when a serious medical condition exists and should never be used unless there is a threat of life or limb. So the principle of applied consent is known as the emergency doctrine. It is a good idea to try and get consent from a spouse or, spouse or relative before treating a patient based on implied consent. All right, and then there's involuntary consent. So involuntary consent applies to patients who are mentally ill in a behavioral uh, crisis or developmentally delayed. And so obtain consent from the garden, guardian or conservator. It is not always possible to obtain consent. So understand your local provisions. For example, many states have protective custody statutes that allow such a person to be taken under law enforcement authority to medical facility. Okay, and then when we talk about consent, there's minors. Okay, so we need to discuss that. So uh, the parent or legal guardian usually gives consent. 
All right. In some states, though, a minor can give consent um, with these following cases. So it could be an emancipated minor. And this means a person who is under the legal age in a given state, but otherwise, uh, because of other circumstances, is legally considered an adult. Many states consider minors to be emancipated if they are married or if they are a member of the armed service services or if they are parents themselves. Also, school teachers and school officials, officials may act in place of the parents and provide consent for treatment to injuries that occur in a school or camp setting. If a true emergency exists and no consent is available, the consent to treat the minor is implied just as it is with an adult. And then you have forcible restraint. So this is necessary for patients who are in need of medical treatment and transportation but are combative and present a risk of danger to themselves or others. So forcible restraint is legally permissible and it, the consult medical control for authorization and utilize law enforcement on the scene. Restrain without legal authority exposes you to potential civil and criminal penalties. Once applied, do not remove restraints en route unless they pose a risk to the patient. Also consider calling ALS, Advanced Life Support Backup, to provide chemical pharmacologic restraint. Okay. So we've talked about the different types of consents, and now we're gonna talk about the right to refuse treatment. So adults who are conscious, alert, and appear to have decision-making capacity have the right to refuse treatment, even if the result is death or serious injury. They can withdraw that from treatment at any time, even if the result is death or serious. Understand though that calls involving refusal of treatment are commonly litigated in the EMS and require you to proceed very cautiously. Involve online medical control and document this consultation. A patient, parent, or caregiver decision to accept or refuse treatment should be based on information that you provide. Your assessment of what might be wrong, a description of the treatment you feel is necessary, any possible risks of treatment, the ability of alternative treatments, and the possibility of consequences of refusing treatment. So when treatment is refused, you must assess the patient's ability to make an informed decision, ask and repeat questions, assess the patient's answers, observe the patient's behavior. If the patient appears to be confused or delusional, you cannot assume that the decision to refuse is an informed refusal. When in doubt, providing treatment is much more defensible position than failing to treat the patient. Do not endanger yourself to provide care, though. Use the assistance of law enforcement to ensure your own safety. Before leaving the scene where a patient, parent, or caregiver has refused care, you should gain, uh, you should again encourage the patient, parent, or caregiver to per permit treatment and to call for an ambulance if he or she has changed their mind or if the condition worsens. Worsen. So advise patients, parents, and caregivers that they can call 911 back if they change their mind. Advise the patient, parent, or caregiver to contact his or her own physician as soon as possible. Ask the patient, parent, or caregiver to sign a refusal of treatment form. And a witness should be present. Thoroughly document all refusals. All right, so we've talked about refusals and now we're moving into confidentiality. So communication between you and the patient is considered confidential. Confidential information includes a patient's history, assessment findings, and the treatments provided. If you inappropriately release this information, you may be liable for breach of confidentiality, which is disclosure of information without proper authorization. So in most states, records may be released only if the patient signs a release, if a legal subpoena is present, or if they need are needed by billing personnel. Okay, so let's talk about HIPAA. 
and HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. HIPAA contains a section on patient privacy that strengthened privacy laws. And so HIPAA provides guidance on which types of information are protected, the responsibility of healthcare providers regarding that protection, and penalties for breaching that protection. So HIPAA considers all patient information you obtain in the course of providing medical treatment to the patient to be protected information. So this is PHI, protected health information. PHI includes medical information and any information that can be used to identify that patient. A failure to abide by the provisions of HIPAA's laws can result in civil or criminal action against you and your agency. The general public is often permitted by law to record identifying and protected patient information and images. All right, so of course, next let's talk about social media. And unless you are operating as an official spokesperson from your agency, avoid logos, uniforms, vehicles, and other markings that associate you with your agency while off duty. Conduct yourself with the same professionalism that you would while on duty. Respect your patients, their friends and families, bystanders, colleagues, and other organizations for which you work for in person and online. Recognize that free speech does not mean everyone has a right to say anything under any circumstances and without repercussions. All right, so now let's talk about some different directives. And we'll talk about advanced directives next. So you may respond to a call where a patient is dying from an illness and a do not resuscitate order, a DNR, gives permission to withhold resuscitation. Do not resuscitate does not mean do not treat though. Even in the presence of a DNR, you are obligated to provide supportive measures. And so some of the supportive measures might include oxygen or pain relief and comfort to the patient who is not in cardiac arrest whenever possible. Each ambulance service should have a protocol to follow in these circumstances. All right, so next is advanced directives. So a written document specifying medical treatment for a competent patient should he or she become unable to make decisions. So most commonly used when the patient becomes comatose. So often referred to as a living well or healthcare directive. In general, a valid DNR order must meet the following requirements, okay? So a DNR must have a clear statement of the decision of the patient's medical problem. A DNR must have a signature of the patient or legal guardian. It must have a signature of one or more physicians or other lic licensed healthcare provider. And a DNR order with an expiration date must be dated within the preceding 12 months to be valid. Okay, so on this figure in the slide, you're gonna see an example of a wallet sized DNR order. You may encounter physician's orders for sustaining treatment. So, and medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, M-O-L-S-T, forms when caring for patients with terminal illnesses. These orders, these medical orders explicitly describe acceptable interventions for the patient. They must be signed by an authorized medical provider to be valid. And if you encounter these documents, contact medical control for guidance. And some patients may have named surrogates to make decisions for them when they can no longer make it on their own. So these are called durable powers of attorney for healthcare, or also known as healthcare proxies. Physical signs of death. So next we're gonna talk about determining um, the cause of death. Um, and that's a medical responsibility of a physician, okay? So presumptive signs of death though, um, include unresponsive to painful stimuli, lack of carotid pulse or heartbeat, and absent of chest rise and fall, no deep tendon or corneal reflexes, absence of pupillary activity, 
no systolic blood pressure, profound cyanosis, and lowered or decreased body temperature. Now, definitive signs of death, okay? So definitive signs of death are um, obvious mortal damage, so some type of de um, decapitation, dependent lividity. So dependent lividity is blood settling to the lowest point of the body, causing discoloration of the skin. And so in the figure on this slide, you could see that the, the patient was um, laying uh, supine and, and to show the dependent lividity has been rolled onto its side. Okay. Also rigor mortis, and that is stiffening of the body muscles caused by chemical changes within the muscle tissue. This occurs between 2 and 12 hours of death, so that is the second sign of uh, death, physical death. And then you have algor mortis, that's the cooling of the body until it uh, matches the ambient temperature. Okay, And then putrefaction or decom decomposition of body tissues, which depending on the temperature conditions, it usually occurs between 40 to 96 hours after death. All right, so medical examiner causes. So involvement of the medical examiner depends on the nature and scene of death. In most states, the medical examiner or coroner in some states must be notified in the following cases. Okay, so a person who is dead on arrival, sometimes called dead on scene death without previous medical um, care, or when the physician is unable to, to state the cause of death. So in any suicide, any violent death, or any poisoning known or um, which is known or sus suspected. And so that's when you're going to get the medical examiner involved. Okay. Also a death from an accident, suspicion of a criminal act, or any infant and child deaths, um, the medical examiner uh, are going to be involved. So you should make every attempt to limit your disturbance of a scene involving a death. If emergency care has to be initiated, keep thorough notes of what is done or found. Okay. All right, so special situations. And organ donors have expressed a wish to donate their organs, okay? So consent is um, uh, information on the donor core card or driver's license. Um, treat potential organ donors the same as you would any other patient, and your priority is to save the patient's life. So remember that organs need oxygen. Okay, and so this is a figure. Um, the figure on this slide shows a sample of an organ donor card. All right. So a medical identification insignia, and these can come in the form of bracelets or necklaces, maybe a keychain or a card indicating a DNR order an allergy, or any other serious medical conditions that might be helpful in assessing and treating the patient. So some patients wear medical bracelets, um, and it could have a USB flash drive. And this uh, often stored as a PDF file that can be read on most computers. The figure on the side displays an example of a medical identification bracelet. All right. So next, we're going to talk about scope of practice, and this outlines the care that you are able to provide, usually is defined by a state law. The medical director further defines the scope of practice by developing protocols or standing orders. Authorization of treatment um, to provide care is given by the medical director, okay? and so. Um, you are going to have that authorization by the medical director. It could either be online, and this includes when you call into the hospital on the radio or a telephone, or also offline. And these are standing orders, okay? So standing orders. And carrying out procedures outside the scope of practice may be considered negligence, okay? Um, so uh, just to reiterate, medical director can give you online orders via the radio or telephone and offline via standing orders or protocol. All right, so standards of care, what are these? And this is the manner in which you must act or behave, and that's called the standard of care. It is defined as how a person with similar training would act under a similar circumstance. So standards of care are established in many ways. 
And the first one is uh, it's a standard imposed by a local custom. So how a responsibly prudent person with similar training and experience would act in a similar circumstance with a similar equipment and in the similar same place or similar place. Okay, so that's imposed by a local custom. Then you have standards imposed by law. And these standards of medical care can be imposed by state statutes, ordinances, administration, regulation, or case law. So be familiar with the particular legal standards in your state. And then you have a standard of care that's established by professional or institutional standards. And so these are recommendations published by organizations and societies that are involved in emergency care. For example, the American Heart Association standard for BLS or CPR. Then you have specific rules and procedures of your EMS agencies. Then you have standards imposed by textbooks. Okay, and then you have standards imposed by states, and these could be Medical Practices Act. So in some states, the EMT is exempt from licensure requirements of a Medical Practices Act. Then you have certification and licensure. So uh, credentialing is established process to determine the qualifications necessary to allow, um, uh, allow people to practice in a particular profession or a function of an organization. So EMTs may be licensed or certified. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is the duty to act. Okay, so duty to act is an individual's responsibility to provide patient care. So once your ambulance responds to a call or treatment has begun, you have the legal duty to act. In most cases, if you're off duty and come upon a crash, you are not legally obligated to stop and assist patients. You um, must know local laws and policies pertaining to your duty to act. Now we're gonna talk about negligence. So negligence is a failure to provide the same care that a person with similar training would provide in the same or similar situation. All four of the on-duty factors must be present, present for legal doctrine of negligence to apply and for a patient um, to prevail in a lawsuit against an EMS service provider. Okay, so you have to have all four of these. You have to have a duty. So the obligation to pr provide care. Uh, then you have to have breach of duty. So the EMT did not act within the accepted or responsible standard of care. Next, you have to have damages. So a patient must physically or physiologically harmed in some noticeable way. Then you have causation. Okay, so um, the causation is uh, a cause and effect relationship between a breach of duty and the damages suffered by the patient. So all four of those have to be present for negligence to apply. All right, next we're gonna talk about res ispa loquitur, and that's an EMT can be held liable under the theory if it can be shown that an injury has occurred. So that the cause of the injury was in the control of the EMT and that the injuries generally do not occur unless there is negligence. Okay, so then we're, we have negligence per se, and that's a theory that can be used when the conduct of the person being sued is alleged to have occurred in clear violation of a statute. So for an example, an EMT performs an advanced life support skill that resulted in injury to the patient. Okay, then you have torts, and so that's a civil wrongs, not within the jurisdiction of U.S. criminal courts. And examples include defamation of character and invasion of privacy. All right, next we're going to talk about abandonment. And so abandonment is a unilateral termination of care by an EMT without the patient's consent and without making any provisions for care to be continued by a medical profession who is competent to provide care for the patient. So once care is started, you have assumed a duty that must not stop until an equally competent medical provider assumes responsibility. Abandonment may take place at the scene or in emergency department where you are dropping off a patient. So obtain a signature on your patient record from the person accepting transfer of care at the hospital. All right. Next, we're going to talk about assault and battery and kidnapping. 
Okay, so assault is unlawfully placing a person in fear of immediate bodily harm. This includes treating uh, or threatening to restrain a patient who does not want to be transported. Battery is unlawfully touching a person, and that, that includes providing medical care without consent. Kidnapping is seizing, confining, abducting, or carrying away by force. That includes a situation where a patient is transported against his or her will. False imprisonment is unauthorized confinement of a person. And serious legal problems may arrive in situations in which a patient has not given or resends consent for treatment and transport. All right. So understand that defamation is the communication of false information that damages a person's reputation. The two types of defamation, written is libel. So written is libel, and then spoken is slander. So understand the two, uh, S, maybe an S, you can under, uh, remember that. So slander is spoken. All statements on your run report should be accurate, relevant, and factual. Okay, so Good Samaritan Laws and Immunity. Good Samaritan Laws are based on a common law principle that when you reasonably help another person, you should, be, you should not be held liable for errors or omissions that are made in giving care. So to be protected though, by provisions of the Good Samaritan Law, several conditions must generally be met, okay? So you must have acted in good faith in rendering care. You rendered care without exception, um, expectation of compensation, okay? And you acted within the scope of your training, and you did not act in a grossly negligent manner. So gross negligence um, is you conduct um, conduct that constitutes a willingful or reckless disregard for a duty or standard of care. Okay, so immunity um, statutes apply to EMS systems that are not considered governmental agencies, and sovereign immunity provides limitations on liabilities and is not complete. All right, so next we're going to talk about some records and reports. So you should compile a complete and accurate record of all inf incidents involving sick or injured patients. In such records, is an important safeguard against legal complications. So the court's perception of records and reports include, if an action or procedure was not recorded on a written report, it was not performed. Okay, so remember that. Incomplete or untidy reports are evidence of incomplete and inexpert emergency medical care provided. NIMSIS is the National EMS Information System. Okay, so um, this provides the ability to collect, store, and share standardized EMS data throughout the United States. So special mandatory reporting requirements. So some states have a reporting obligation for healthcare providers and emergency responders, including EMTs. The following are all mandatory reporting requirements that may vary from state to state, though. So child abuse, abuse of an elder um, person, or abuse of at-risk adults are mandatory reporting. Also, injury during commission of a felony or drug-related injuries and childbirth are all mandatory reporting requirements. Attempted suicides, dog bites, certain communicable diseases, assaults, and domestic violence are also special mandatory reporting required. Sexual assault or rape, exposures to infectious diseases, transports of patients in restraints, scene of a crime or the deceased are all mandatory reporting requirements. All right, so next we're going to talk about ethical responsibilities. So in addition to legal duties, EMTs have certain ethical responsibilities as healthcare providers. Ethics is a philosophy of right and wrong, moral duties, and ideal professional behavior. So morality is a code of conduct affecting character, conduct, and consequence. Bioethics specifically addresses ethical issues that arise in the practice of healthcare. EMTs will encounter ethical dilemmas that will require you to evaluate and apply ethical standards. 
So these include your own and the those of the profession. So applied ethics is the manner in which principles of ethics are incorporated into professional conduct. Allow rules, laws, and policies to guide your decision making. All right, next we're going to talk about the EMT in court. And of course, you don't ever want to end up in court, but you can end up in court as either a witness or a defendant. So the case could be either civil or criminal. Whenever you're subpoenaed to testify in any court proceeding, you should immediately notify your service director and legal counselor. If you're our witness, remain neutral during your testimony and review the run report before the court appearance. As the defendant, an attorney is required. So the attorney is generally supplied by your service in a civil suit. Defenses may include statutes of limitation, so the time within which a case is uh, must be commenced, governmental immunity, generally applied to municipalities or governmental entities. If your service is covered by immunity, it may mean that you cannot be sued at all or that it would limit the amount of monetary judgment rendered. And then contributory negligence. So a legal defense that may be raised when the defendant feels that the conduct of the plaintiff somehow contributed to injuries or damages sustained by the plaintiff. And then there's discovery. So an opportunity for both sides to obtain more information to reach a better understanding of the case. So discovery includes um, uh, depositions, and that's an oral request or for questions. And then also includes interrogatories. So that's a written request or question. And then there's the trials. So most cases are settled following the discovery phase during a settlement phase and do not go to trial. Um, for those though that do go to trial, several types of damages could be awarded. So you could have consent, cons compensatory damages and those are intended to compensate the plaintiff for the injuries he or she has sustained. And then punitive damages are intended to deter the defendant from repeating the behavior and are reserved for cases where the defendant has acted um, uh, reckless disregard or um, intentionally um, for the safety of the public. So these damages are not commonly awarded in negligent cases. Okay. All right. In most cases, if a judgment is rendered against you, your service or its insurance carrier will pay the judgment. Any EMT charged with a criminal offense should secure the services of a highly experienced criminal attorney immediately. Okay, and that concludes chapter three. Next, we're gonna go over the um, uh, review questions. Okay, see if we missed anything. So you arrive at a scene of an older woman complaining of chest pain. In assessing her, she holds her arm out for you to take her blood pressure. This is an example of what do you think? Express consent. So also called actual consent is when the patient authorizes you to provide treatment and transport either verbally or non-verbally. Her holding her arm out is that non-verbal consent. Okay, which of the following is an example of abandonment? Okay, so that's when we're going to leave the patient with somebody less trained than us. Okay, so an EMT leaves the scene after a refusal. EMT transfers care in the department. Nope, to a nurse. A EMT transfers to a paramedic or an AMT. So an advanced EMT transfers to an, um, an EMR. And that's going to be it. D. Okay, so a lesser training was, uh, was transferred. All right. The unauthorized confinement of a person is called false imprisonment. And so um, that's confinement of a person without the legal authority or their consent. Okay, so failure of an EMT provide the same care as another EMT with the same training is called. And we know this, this is, that's negligence, right? Okay, so C is negligence. Liable is the written, remember, and slander is the statement, verbal. Okay, an eight-year-old boy was struck by a car. He's unresponsive and bleeding from his mouth. 
the police officer tells you that he isn't able to contact the parents, you should. And we're going to continue to treat the child and transport as soon as possible because that's what we would think that they would want us to do, right? Right. It's implied consent. An advanced directive is, and what is an advanced directive? Well, we know it's a written document, right? And uh, so let's see. It is a written document, I'm almost positive, of, um, of what the provide the patient would um, would want to be uh, care provided. Okay, let us see. Which of the following patients is competent and can legally refuse EMS care? Okay, so no confusion. A man who's staggering, nope. A conscious and alert patient who is in severe pain, hmm. Um, let's see what they say. Oh, they say a conscious and alert, even though they're in uh, a lot of pain, they can refuse. Okay, you are treating a patient with an apparent emotional crisis. After the patient refuses care, you tell him that you will call the police and have him restrained if he does not give you consent. Your actions in this case are an example of, what do we think? Oh my goodness. Um, it is unlawfully placing a person in fear of immediate body uh, bodily harm, right? So it is assault. Okay, so an EMT has a legal duty to act if he or she is, what do you think? It's paid for his services, um, but is not on duty? What do you, uh, a volunteer is on duty and dispatched? Well, I said, all right, there you go. Um, um, paid or volunteer. And last one, which of the following statements about records are, and reports are false? Okay, let's see. So D, your patient care report does not become a part of the patient's hospital report. That's false because it does become a, a part of the patient's hospital report. That this concludes chapter three, medical, legal, and ethical issues. And if you like this lecture, go ahead and uh, subscribe and like. Thanks.